SCP-6881 Supplementary Document Echo This is Hector he This is Agent Hector Gallio. The following information is classified level 5 under Project Serapis. O5 eyes only. Continue research into the history of Shibbets Vale at the foot of the Morning Cloak Mountains in southern Montana. Uncovered a significant event in 1981 that occurred on the nearby Lake Apasawa. In the autumn of that year, an event was organized for fans of the Big Sky Beauty series of historical romance novels by author Gwendolyn McCoy. These books were set in the fictional region of Montana, inspired by the Morning Cloak Mountains. And so the event was marketed to fans as the chance to see the world of the books in person. At the time of the event, the series consisted of 22 novels and had a devoted readership who organized themselves via a mailing list. Members of this mailing list booked the Comfort Arms Inn, a hotel in the town of Scarslow, as the base for a three-day event attended by Gwendolyn McCoy and a group of bands. Among the attendees were Loretta Persons, a 53-year-old woman from Kentucky who had flown to Montana for the event. She recorded her activities in a journal, which was in the possession of the Scarslow Police and was acquired using Foundation protocols. Gwendolyn McCoy was a pen name for New York-based author Gabriella Zampori. She wrote of her experiences at the Scarslow event in preparation for a memoir that was never written. These notes were acquired from her estate via data intrusion by C-Class computer security personnel. Parsons' journal and Zampori's notes were the core of the research into the 1981 event. While the events were publicly known and covered in the media, examination of the first-hand evidence suggests the Scarslow Police covered up the potentially anomalous aspects. It is becoming apparent the Scarslow PD is consistently involved in covering up anomalies in Shibbets Vale, though it is not yet certain if this was part of an ongoing conspiracy or a series of decisions made by individual police officers. In the experience of the Foundation, law enforcement frequently ignores or destroys evidence of anomalous events for reasons of convenience. The Scarslow PD seems a regular offender in this sense. McCoy Convention Journals Classified 5 Therapists 1992 Scarslow Shibbets Bale, Montana, USA Persons Concerned Gabriella Zampori, female, 40 Writer from New York under pen name Gwendolyn McCoy Loretta Parsons, female, fifties, housewife and romance novel fan. Materials: Journal transcripts, written. Parsons Journal, 1/4. The Journal of Loretta Parsons. Arrived at Scarsville this morning. Met a few of us girls at the airport in Billings, and we all took the bus together. It's so wonderful to talk with other bands. I only know them through the letters that get published in the mailing list. We all talked about our favorite characters and what we hoped could happen in the next books. Of course, I love Connie the schoolmistress most of all. She's so wholesome and I just hope she finds a nice man to settle down with. I'll ask Gwendolyn if she can give Connie a happy ending. Scarslow is, well, I'll say it's quaint, old-fashioned. Maybe that's being kind, but I'm sure the countryside around it is much prettier. The people at the Comfort Arms Inn were very pleasant and have set aside the restaurant for the meet and greet tomorrow. I can't wait. My shoulders bruised from carrying my bag with all the books for her to sign. There were four little girls in the lobby when I went up. There weren't any grown-ups with them. I don't know why that struck me as strange, but it did. I freshened up in my room and ate with the other ladies. I was surprised that not all of them liked Connie as much as I do. Some of them insist that Margaret, the frontier wife, or even Betsy the Fallen Woman is the best character. Well, I didn't want to get into anything, but Connie's journey is the real heart of the series. Still, it was all very civilized. They had breadsticks. Tomorrow is the meet and greet. After reading her books for so long, I feel like I really know Gwendolyn, and her characters are my family. I bet it'll be like seeing a long-lost friend. Zampori Notes 1-4 the notes of Gabriella Zampori. God, this place is a hole. I knew it can't all be wood cabins and rosy cheeks, but Jesus, couldn't the mailing list people find somewhere a bit more upmarket? There's no decent restaurants, 
The hotel barely scrapes half a star, and the townspeople look like they're on heroin, though I can't blame them. I got the organizers to pay for Anton to come with me, thank God. One should never undergo a place like Scarslow without a personal assistant. I sent him out to find a coffee place or a wine bar where I can hide from the bands if it all gets too exhausting, though I don't hold out much hope. I insisted the hotel staff take me in through the kitchen door so I don't get buttonholed by a horde of readers on my way to my room. Thankfully it worked, though I caught a glimpse of some of them in the restaurant. They looked like piles of cream cheese poured into floral print dresses. You could have wrapped the varicose veins around the world. Still, can't laugh at them too hard. They're the people paying my rent. It used to be, for events like this, I'd put on my Gwendolyn mask. The accent, the gosh darn homespun wisdom, school marm glasses, the whole bit. These days I just don't have the energy. They're gonna have to take me as I am. I'll still use the name, though. No need to shatter that particular illusion. Anton hauled the box of Siren of the Morning Cloaks into the function room. It's two months before it comes out. The publishers only gave me twenty or so copies, so the old dears will be tearing each other's liver spots off to get one. Should be fun to watch. It's kind of trash, but I only had three months to get the thing from outline to first draft, and they'll eat it up like Valium as long as they have a pretty girl and some nice scenery on the cover, and Gwendolyn's name on the spine. Once I get a nest egg tucked away from the royalties, I'll kill the whole thing off and start something I can be proud of. I was proud of Big Sky Beauty at first, of course. The first three are good, but now I'm just treading water until I can escape this damn place. Funny thing, I'd never been to Montana before, but even before I got here, I couldn't wait to leave. Parsons Journal, 2 4 Today was the day, the chance to meet Gwendolyn McCoy. I had to be patient, though. In the morning we went on an excursion to the reservation. The ones in the books were Shoshone, while these were Crow, but I guess it's all mostly the same. I thought it would be a little bit more… traditional. A lot of the men still wear their hair long, and there was a historical center with a gift store and a totem pole, but the rest looked the same as back in Scarslow. I asked the man at the little museum where the wigwams and so were and he said they lived in regular houses now. Tell the truth, he was a little bit snippy. You'd think they'd lay on something for the people who come all the way to see them. The historical center was kind of interesting. There was a recreation of a big wooden lodge with feather headdresses and tomahawks and so on hanging on the walls. Lots of pottery and arrowheads. There was an old Indian man there who was replacing one of the exhibits, and I got to talking to him. I said I had read so much said among the morning cloaks that I felt I knew the place already. And he said the crow didn't live near the mountains. The reservation grounds was as close as they ever got. He said the crow didn't really come over to Shibbets Vale. It, alongside much of the Yellowstone area, was considered neutral land between nearby tribes. But in the late 1800s, settlers first moved into the area. They kept to themselves. Then at some point, Things got bad and they got sick or something. At some point, they resorted to coming down to the valley and trying to steal from other settlers, or the nearby tribes, but they always avoided the Crow tribe. He wasn't really sure why. It's not at all like the stories I see on TV or read in the books. I asked if these other six settlers left anything behind. He said they didn't know the area well, so the things they did build all rotted and fell apart. They weren't great builders, but there were a couple of things the museum didn't show to the public. One was a thing made of skulls and twigs, and he said it was an image of the god they believed in, but it wasn't the Christian god most white folk believed in. I think it was shaped kind of like a woman, but it was hard to tell. The other thing was a roll of tree bark this other tribe used to write on. I was surprised it hadn't just crumbled to dust. The museum kept it in a glass case out back of the lodge. It showed this lady being hunted by men with swords, and swimming across a river, or maybe the sea, then lying down the earth and the Indians coming to live where she lay. The old man said the pictures at the end were the dreams the strange tribe had about her. But honestly, it was so strange and jumbled up, it could have been anything. The guy at the front desk came and talked to the old guy in her language, and of course I didn't know what was said, 
but I think she wasn't happy at all. He said to excuse him because he had to go see to some maintenance elsewhere on the reservation, and I thanked him for showing me such interesting things, even if I didn't really understand it. The front desk man apologized, and I said not at all. It was quite fascinating, especially about the Morning Cloak Mountains and the strange tribe there, and he seemed a little alarmed. I felt kind of awkward about it all, so I bought a Dreamcatcher from the gift shop and left. Zampori Notes 2-4 Last night's book signing went as well as expected. They queued up and withered away, and told me how much my work meant to them. I told them they were welcome and how much it meant to hear how reading Big Sky Beauty had got them through this bereavement or that divorce. They all had their favorites, I've noticed. One lady even liked Connie the schoolmistress. I can't even remember if Connie is still alive. Did she get run over by the stagecoach, or was that Sally Ann the prospector's daughter? I should have kept better notes. There were four little girls there, too. They had a copy of Siren of the Morning Cloaks between them. Pocket money, I guess. They couldn't have been older than eleven or twelve. I was surprised, because the books get a little racy sometimes. Plenty of blouses getting ripped and heaving bosoms over the years. Still, I guess if they're reading, they're not off scoring reefer or getting pregnant or whatever kids do these days. They asked me about bears. There were bears in the mountains, they said. I said yes. One of them attacked Jebediah the Trapper in Desperado Trail. They told me bears hibernate, and I said I knew. They wake up sometimes, they told me. Sometimes even when they're asleep, they have to wake up to feed. I don't know. Kids are strange. One of the reasons I never had one. Parsons Journal 3-4 Then we went back to the hotel in time for afternoon drinks and then, then meet and greet. I finally got to meet Gwendolyn McCoy. I guess she was still tired from her flight. I mean, she was very nice, but not at all what I expected. She sounded like she was from New York. She said hi to everybody, and thank you for coming, and how much it meant that we loved her book so much. Then the little man who accompanied her opened a box with a new book, and we all queued up to buy it, of course, then lined up to get it signed. I had all the other books with me. So did a lot of the other ladies. I thought I saw her baseball when she saw the first one bringing out all twenty-one books. Well, twenty-two now, from her luggage, but maybe I was mistaken. She talked and answered questions while she signed all the books, and the little man brought her bottled water and cups of coffee from the hotel bar. Of course, when it was my turn, I talked about Connie and whether she would find love. She said every character has their own journey and some don't even have it planned out yet. She has to wait for the characters to tell her where the journey should take them. Connie isn't in a new book, but plenty of characters have gone away and come back again, so I wasn't worried. It was such a busy day I turned in after dinner. We were all excited about the new book. I couldn't help but read a couple of chapters of Siren of the Morning Cloaks before I fell asleep. It has that feeling I love, the reassurance of something familiar, something predictable. It looks like Betsy the Fallen Woman is the lead character, which I admit isn't my favorite, but the rest is all there. The big sky, the quaint little town, the mountains, the meaningful looks and longing sighs. It all seems so comforting when you know what's going to happen. Zampori Notes 3 4 This morning I could happily have stayed in bed. Signing is always exhausting. Still, I had the faintest reminder of why I started writing. These people really love what I write, and if it brings them happiness, why shouldn't they read my books, and talk about which frontier widow should end up with which rugged cowboy, and drag themselves halfway across the country to meet the author? I felt bad about making fun of them. They're just trying to be happy like everyone else. We sold out a siren in the morning cloaks, and after I perked up with some coffee, I mentioned we should do something to celebrate. Anton suggested we join the ladies on an excursion to Shibbit Vale and I actually said yes, although on the condition he drove me, rather than me taking the tour bus they hired. I'm not feeling quite that generous of spirit. The countryside here isn't what I imagined. I had seen plenty of photographs back when I still did research, but they didn't capture the Morning Cloak Mountains or the forest around Shibbit Vale. And if I'd seen them firsthand, I couldn't have written about them, not while making it all sound cozy and wholesome. 
The beauty here isn't of unspoiled and burdened America. It's something less welcoming. The trees crowd up against the mountains like waves crashing against rocks. The land rears up and folds around the roads and pathways like it's only yielding to us grudgingly. I wish I was good enough to encompass the feeling of it. Beautiful. Threatening. Unknowable. Like a wild animal. It made me wish I'd set Big Sky Beauty in a different part of the state, where it was more like a chocolate box and less like a different world entirely. The group had organized a nature trek starting at a summer camp there, Camp Apasawa. It seemed better days, but the morning cloaks looming down above made even the tumble-down cabins look like they were full of stories. I didn't really feel like the nature walk, so I stayed at the campsite with Anton. Bless him. He'd brought a cooler of drinks and snacks. I watched the ladies toddle off into the forest, and it felt like Shibbet's bell was swallowing them. I remembered the little girls at the signing, and the way bears sometimes wake up the feed. Just when I thought of them, there they were, those four girls. They were dressed the same, all cute in summer dresses. Three were white and one was black. The youngest maybe nine and the oldest twelve, I guess. Anton was off trying to find a working faucet. He's better with kids than I am. The oldest one asked me if I wanted to see the forest. I explained that I was just fine where I was, and she said no, the real forest. Not the one all the ladies were headed. I don't know what happened next. I mean, I know, of course, I went with them. I held the oldest one's hand, and they led me into the trees. What I mean is, I don't know why. It just seemed the right thing to do, like it was always going to happen. They led me through the trees, where there was no trail. I kept stumbling over the roots and scratching my arms on the low branches. It was so close and dense I couldn't see the sky. It was like writhing through a warren of bark and pine needles. The girls giggled and laughed, skipping along, dragging me behind them. The trees were covered in moss, twisted and split and looked thousands of years old. They came to an opening in the trees, where the branches met overhead and made it feel like a cave of dark green stone. Where the branches split from the trunks, there were bunches of fat white fruit, like swollen pears. Their flesh was pale and bany. The oldest girl picked one and took a bite out of it. It was good, she said. The other girls picked one each too and started eating. The smell of the fruit made me dizzy like a heavy, sweet perfume. Of course, I had to eat one. There was no question. It didn't even occur to me to hesitate. I can't even regret doing it, because it felt like I was a different person. If I was a better writer, I could describe what it was like to eat that fruit. The girl was telling the truth. It was good. It was more than good. It melted in my mouth and I melted with it. While my body stood there, my body dissolved into the earth. I felt the mountain and the lake as a part of me, and the roots of the thousands of trees like fingers raking right through me. I came apart, and I was remade far down below in the warm, damp earth. I didn't see what was down there, but I felt it. It was huge and alive. It was sleeping, but it was also aware. I had the impression of a huge cocoon, something protecting an immense power inside of it. When it spoke, it wasn't in words, but in thoughts it forced directly into my head. It told me it wanted me to stay with it and serve it. It was an honor, a new existence, a whole life beyond the understanding I had of the world. It was sacred. It was forever. I wanted to, oh god, I wanted to so much. But you know what the stupid thing was? I'd have to stop writing. If I stayed there in Shibbet's Vale, serving whatever this thing was, I would never go back to my apartment in my office. I would never sit there typing until three in the morning trying to think of new ways to say how big the sky looked. I never understood how much writing meant to me until that moment, when I saw an eternal life ahead of me without it. The being showed me a world with lush beauty from one horizon to the next. Civilization had rotted away, and only purity was left. No more pain. No more hatred or fear, just uncorrupted nature, until the end of time. But it was too late. I was scared. 
and the fear didn't let go. I could feel myself rushing upwards, through the layers of the dirt and mulch, through the thousands of years that lay on this place, past the rocks and the tree, roots, the old bones. I was back with myself again, in the hollow in the forest. The girls were still there, but they weren't smiling. They just stared at me. I dropped the remains of the fruit into the dirt. They watched as I walked backwards, away from them. I was shivering and sweating, and there was a taste in my mouth like it had been filled with gravel and mud. I ran away from them. Four little girls, and they were suddenly scarier than a crazy guy on a subway. I tripped again and cut myself on the branches. Thank God I hadn't got turned around. I don't know how long it took, but I stumbled out from the trees back into the campsite. Anton was looking through the windows of the cabins, trying to find me. He ran up to me and said I'd been gone for more than two hours. He didn't know if I had gone on a damn nature walk after all, or if I'd gotten hurt somehow, or was in one of the buildings for whatever reason. I had to make up an excuse in a hurry, so I told him I was answering the call of nature behind a tree and got lost. He said the bathrooms were right by the camp's mess hall. I said something dumb about wanting to get into the spirit of the great outdoors for the first time in my life. He didn't buy it, but he knew not to push. The bathrooms had a mirror, and I looked like I had just survived a plane crash. I was a mess. The scratches were mostly on my arms, so I could cover them with a sweater I'd left in the car. I fixed my hair as best I could. I just looked exhausted, not traumatized or fleeing through the forest from God knows what. I sat not saying much until the ladies got back from their hike, gabbling about some butterfly they'd seen or a deer that had looked at them. I was so grateful to see them. Aside from Anton, they were the only piece of normality from there to Billings. I talked with a couple of them before the coach driver said it was time to go. They all said they understood how Shippage Bell had inspired me so much. I didn't say I just read the name off a map at random, of course. But when I told them, it had made emotions in me beyond just being a pretty stretch of country. It was true. It's as if actually seeing it justified setting my writing there. Like I'd been inspired retroactively somehow. And what I saw there had always been locked away in big sky beauty, waiting for me to decipher it. Stupid, I know. But it made a sort of magical sense. I kept a couple of sleeping pills in my purse in case I really needed to knock myself out. I needed to that night. I took one as soon as we got back to the hotel, and thank God, I didn't remember my dreams. Parsons Journal 4 4 The nature walk was really pretty. It wasn't like the pictures on the book covers, though. I wasn't disappointed, it just felt… different. It felt dangerous somehow. I thought if I strayed off the trail I might fall down a gorge or be eaten by a mountain lion. Just me being silly, of course. We were all quiet on the trail, believe me. That's not like us at all. Once you get into the forest with the trees all closing in around you, it seems wrong to get too loud. There was a point where we reached the top of a ridge, where the ground dropped away suddenly, and I could see down to Shibbage Bale and the lands around it. That was when I understood why Gwendolyn had set her books here. In that moment, it was as if the modern world had never happened. I could almost see the schoolhouse and the saloon, the sheriff's station, and the homesteads all over the far hills. I imagined I was Connie, seeing the valley that would be her new home for the first time, and all the years of romance and heartbreak that would follow. When we got back to the campsite, suddenly we were all talkative again. I was sorry to see Shibbets Bale go when the bus pulled away. I wish I'd been born back then, when things were simple. The ladies wanted to find a nice place to eat, but I guess Scarlow isn't much of a dining out kind of town. While we were discussing where to go at the hotel, I saw the little girls in the lobby again. They said they knew we were from out of town, and asked if we wanted to see the lake. Now the lake looked real pretty too, but I'd only seen it from a distance, so I said sure. They had this strange way about them, those girls, this odd kind of confidence. When I was a girl, and a grown-up talked to me, I would just stare at my shoes and say yes ma'am, no ma'am, but these were rather precocious. They told me there was a man in town who would hire out his boat to take us around the lake. I mentioned it to the other ladies, 
and they said it would just be the thing to cap off the last day of our trip. After all, we all remember when Rodrigo proposed to Martha on the lake in Homestead Hearts. I can't wait. Zampori notes, 4 slash 4 I was hungover. I hadn't drunk anything the night before, but whatever was in that weird fruit had given me a mother and father of mornings after. Anton fetched me coffee and aspirin, which was all I could stomach for breakfast. The readers were off on another trip. This time it was boating on Lake Apasawa. Anton said I really should go, since it was the end of the event and would give them a chance to say goodbye. I'd rather have just hightailed at the Billings, but that would be me sitting around the airport for god knows how long, so I decided I might as well go along. I wasn't about to get on a boat in my state, but the fresh air might help. This time I took the coach. I forgot to get Anton to arrange a car. Thankfully I was sat next to the lady who loved Connie the schoolmistress and she did all the talking for the two of us. I just had to listen as she told me all about her favorite scenes, how she thought she would have been born in frontier times instead of now, how my books had given her something predictable and cozy when her husband got ill. It was strangely relaxing, just listening to it all pouring out of her. I looked up the names after it all. I think she was Lottie Parsons. I sat in the shade on the shore of the lake while an old guy from Scarslow loaded seven of the ladies onto his boat at the jetty the old summer camp used. The rest stayed on the shore for a picnic. The boat looked a little suspect, but it was a calm day, and Lake Abasawa isn't much bigger than a decent-sized pond, and I figured how dangerous could it be. When the boat pulled away from the jetty, I was more concerned with looking out for those four girls than I was watching my fans having a lake adventure. I'm not sure how long they were out there for when I heard Anton say it looked like the boat might be in trouble. He was right. It was pitching side to side, and the passengers were having to hold on. It was strange, because there was barely any wind, and most of the lake was calm. But the water around the lake was churning. I thought it was some kind of engine trouble, and that the boat would be stranded until another boat could come out and rescue them. Then the boat heaved all the way up out of the water. The prow was lifted up into the air, and the boat went near vertical. A couple of the passengers fell out. It slammed back down into the water, and the front went under for a moment, swamping it. People on the shore cried out. I could just make out the boat's owner trying to get the boat bailed out, but the water turned again, and the boat was pulled down by one side. I saw something underneath it, brown gray muscle, shiny and wet, masses of it scarred and blubbery like a whale's. A length of it rose up and curled up over the boat, wrapping around it. A tentacle. A tentacle as thick as a redwood trunk. It dragged the boat down under the water. The last I saw of it was the stern sticking straight up, and one of the passengers clambering onto it and holding onto the boat's engine. Then they were gone too, with the water boiling around them and lengths of dark tentacles surging back under the surface. We all stood and stared. What were we supposed to do? Anton found a phone somewhere and called the police. He was the only one who wasn't completely paralyzed by what he'd seen. He told the cops on the phone the boat had gotten into trouble and gone down. He didn't mention anything else. Neither did we. Everyone who saw it agreed without saying it that we hadn't seen anything other than the boat go down. The cops talked to us, but it wasn't an interrogation or anything. The guy's boat was rickety. It had struck a hidden obstruction, or the engine had blown. It took on water and went down faster than it could be bailed out. Simple. While we filed onto the bus back to Scarslow, I'm sure I saw those four girls watching from the edge of the woods. It wasn't a surprise to see them. They were a part of Shibbet's Bale, just like the forest in the lake. They had told me there were bears in the woods, and bears hibernate, and sometimes, the bears have to wake up the feed. Commentary Dr. Gallio McCoy Convention Journals Classified 5 Slash Serapis Following the loss of eight people, including seven tourists and the boat's pilot, Lake Apasawa was searched by county police working with the Search and Rescue Service. They focused on the area the boat was last seen. Nothing was found except for some floating debris. It was speculated that currents in the lake 
might have brought the bodies into the Whitetail River, but no bodies were recovered from the river either. If the authorities suspected any anomalous elements to the loss of the boat and its passengers, they were never written down anywhere. The deaths of Loretta Parsons and the seven other victims were officially recorded as accidental, with contributing factors being poor oversight of pleasure boating and failure to enforce licensing and safety inspections. Siren of the Mountain Cloaks was the last in the Big Sky Beauty series. Gabriella Zampori is not known to have written again, though her accumulation of notes suggests she intended to write an autobiography, or perhaps her own account of the Lake Apasawa boating incident. She died in 2019, at the age of 80, having lived off royalties and the licensing fees from the early 1990s TV adaptation of the series' early novels. There is no record of her ever having spoken officially about the 1981 incident. It is likely the creature Gabriella Zampori witnessed attacking the boat was SCP-6881. If not, there are two separate monsters connected to Lake Apasawa, which the Foundation has established is statistically unlikely. Given its long-term inhabitation of Shibbage Vale, it makes sense the entity would have to emerge to beat occasionally. More intriguing is the possibilities it has entities that can interact with the local population, such as the four girls seen by both Loretta Parsons and Gabriella Zampori, and who can act on its wishes. That concludes my research into the events in Shibbage Vale during 1981. This information is classified Level 5 for O5 eyes only. Agent Hector Gallio, signing off.